let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, Brian Day uh, will tell us about NASA's solar system treks. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you very much. Well, once again, I'm Brian Day. I'm from NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. Way too long a name. But that's uh, NASA Ames Research, Research Center in California. And I want to thank you all for having me tonight. I'm going to talk about a project that I'm very pleased to be working on. It is the NASA Solar System Trex portals. And this is a set of data visualization and analysis portals that are web-based. They're online. Uh, they work in your browser. You don't buy anything. You don't install anything. You just point your browser to trek.nasa.gov. And this is a set of tools that are used for planetary science, for mission planning, and for education and outreach. Uh, we have a range of portals that cover a number of planetary bodies, including planets, moons, asteroids, and it's a growing list. But what these allow you to do is view the surfaces of many different worlds as seen through the eyes of many different instruments aboard many different spacecraft. I'll start out with our lunar portal, that is the Moon Trek portal. Now you can get to all of our portals through that main website, trek.nasa.gov. Uh, the Moon Trek portal is currently being used to support mission planning for our upcoming missions to the surface of the Moon. Uh, it provides thousands literally thousands of different data products from different instruments that are geo-referenced and co-registered so that you can view the surface of the moon in many different ways. Uh, like any good GIS system, you can pan and zoom. Here we'll zoom in to the crater Tycho. And of course, one of the things you might want to know first about Tycho is, well, how big is it? Fortunately, we have a number of tools that are available to you to help you analyze what you're seeing. Um, we will start out with the calculate distance tool here, highlighted up top. I'm also going to talk, call your attention real quick. At the very bottom, it says, are you a scientist? What you're seeing here in the list of tools are our general tools that are available to anyone. But for researchers and mission planners, you can register for an account and get access to our high-end tools for actual surface operations planning. But right now, let's take a look at dis distance measurement. This is available to anyone. And measuring the size of the Tycho Crater is as simple as drawing a line across it. And it'll come back and let you know that here we're looking at something in excess of 85 kilometers across. Similarly, you might want to know how deep is it. Our elevation profile tool, again, allows you to draw a line across the crater here. And you can see that you get a nice elevation profile. So you can measure the heights of mountains, the depths of craters and valleys. Comes in very handy. You can also draw a bounding box around any terrain you want and have the portal generate for you an STL or OBJ file that you can then send to your 3D printer and make 3D prints of any part of the lunar surface you want. Another really fun aspect is the ability to draw a path with your mouse anywhere across the surface of the moon. The portal will then return to you a QR code that you can scan into your smartphone Put your smartphone in a pair of cheap, you know, five, ten dollar Google Cardboard compatible goggles. And whatever path you drew, you will now fly in virtual reality. That's a lot of fun. We have different projections available within the Moon Track portal. So there's an uh, equal rectangular projection, there's both north and south polar projections. And then there's also a 3D globe projection that allows you to interactively fly across 
the surface of the moon using your standard keyboard game controls and mouse. So here we'll fly down into Tycho Crater and actually go roving across the floor of the crater. Now, as I mentioned, we have these very different views that are available. So let's take a look at and an example. We'll go here to the Marius Hills on the moon, one of the most spectacular collections of volcanic peaks on the moon. But as seen here through the LROC wide angle camera, an excellent camera, um, it just really doesn't look all that spectacular. You know, there, there are great volcanoes here, but they're not showing up due to the nature of lunar volcanoes tending to have very small slopes. But if we switch our view now to a laser altimetry view, you'll see how those volcanic peaks suddenly just jump right out. They become very, very evident. Now we can load another view. We'll go and grab a gravity map view. This is from the Kaguya spacecraft. And we're looking at the exact same area, but with a very different view. Here we're seeing variations in gravi gravity. We're seeing blue representing low, red representing high. And you can just keep grabbing these different views through different instruments and essentially create a stack of different images. For each data product in your stack, you can do a number of things, including download that data product. But one of my favorite things is you can adjust their order in a stack and you can adjust transparency between layers. This allows you to blend different data products. So here we are blending that laser altimetry view with the gravity map view. And by doing so, we're able to visualize both the surface morphology of the volcanic field as well as through the coloration, visualize the now solidified unerupted plug of magma beneath the volcanic field. This is really, really neat. Now, we'll turn our attention to a south polar projection and look at the south pole of the moon. There's a lot of interest in the south pole of the moon right now. And through, again, the LROC uh, camera aboard the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we see an area that is very intensely shadowed because the sunlight is coming in essentially horizontally. And parts of these shadows are actually permanent. Um, but with all this shadowing, it, of course, makes any kind of planning of activities very difficult. But again, if we switch our view to a laser altimetry view, we can pierce those shadows. And we can see the floors of these craters that were previously obscured to us. We can also switch to a slope map view, coloring blue here is uh, relatively flat. Again, red would be somewhat dangerous, would be definitely dangerous to try and drive a rover down. We can overlay those areas of permanent shadow, areas where uh, the sunlight hasn't shown in oftentimes over a billion years. These areas are consequently very, very cold. These are among the coldest areas we have measured anywhere in the solar system, getting down around 40 Kelvin. And consequently, these are areas where you may have deposits of water ice that are potentially available to us as a resource. Similarly, in our hunt for the resource of water ice, we might want to take a look at a temperature map. So here, using the diviner instrument aboard LRO, we're looking at an average temperature or looking at maximum temperatures. Again, good for isolating where to look for potential deposits of ice. We can also use the LAMP instrument aboard LRO to look for potential deposits of surface frost. 
and we can use neutron spectrometry to look for concentrations of hydrogen, which again could give us clues as to the presence of water. Using thermal modeling, we can map ice stability at depth. How far would you have to dig down beneath the surface to get to a temperature where ice could remain stable? And in some of those permanently shadowed areas, you don't have to dig at all. Ice can remain stable right there at the surface. So these are the kinds of things, the kinds of investigations you can do looking at the area of the South Pole, which is going to have a great deal of activity in the very short term in the upcoming years. We can also take advantage of the high resolution of the narrow angle camera, and we can zoom in to the rim of Shackleton, heading down to sub-meter resolution. Now, as I mentioned, there are a number of other portals. And so let's do a quick tour of the solar system using the solar system treks. Mm. We do have the Mars Trek portal. And here you see the planet Mars as it would look if you were looking out the window of an orbiting spacecraft. Mars is, of course, a complete desert today. There's no liquid water found anywhere on the surface. But if we change our view to, again, a laser altimetry view, and we color code that laser altimetry view so that blue represents the low altitudes, red represents the high, we can see clear evidence of Mars's watery past. We can see ancient river channels flowing into what was once a large bay that then opened up into a great northern ocean on Mars well over 3 billion years ago. Speaking of Mars's watery past, we can zoom into Yezero Crater, where currently the Perseverance rover is beginning its exploration. So you can see the Yezero Crater is marked in the center here and the landing site. Let's zoom down into it. With a closer view here, we see uh, inlet channels where water flowed into Yezero, which was once a great crater lake. We see an uh, inflow channel on the west and coming in from the north. And then on the east, we can see an outflow channel where the lake actually overflowed. Continuing our zoom in, the landing site we can see is actually uh, just to the southeast of a great delta deposit where that inflow channel coming in from the west deposited a great deal of mud, sand, and gravel on the floor of the crater lake. That's an area that we really want to explore. Zooming in more closely to the landing site, we see it is right next to a field of sand dunes, and the spacecraft was smart enough to avoid landing in those sand dunes. Zooming in closer, and now we'll turn our field of view from the landing site looking out toward the wall of the delta deposit. And in the background, the mountains you see are the actual crater rim of Yesero Crater. We can advance forward to the face of the delta deposit that the rover is going to examine. And we can see the layered stratigraphy of the sedimentary deposits in the delta deposit in the great delta deposit here and we can go examine the breach in the crater wall through which water flowed in through that western inflow channel we can go examine outside of the crater the actual riverbed of that western inflow channel of course, there are other areas on Mars that are well worth investigating. Valles Marineris is an incredibly spectacular feature. And along much of its length, it is adorned by gigantic landslides, such as Ius Labes here. We can see that, like the Grand Canyon here on Earth, it is actually a network of smaller features with a great deal of detail. 
And again, going into the 3D globe mode and interactive, we can fly down into Valles Marineris, examining the sedimentary deposits at the bottom of ancient paleo lake beds laid down when this was once filled with water. And then we can zoom up the 8,000 meter face of the northern wall. Very spectacular. Another area of great interest are the Cerberus fossae. And these are great rifts in the crust of Mars. And the Mars Insight probe with its seismometer has now detected that this is an area of active seismic activity. Mars quakes are being generated here. And you can see these magnificent rifts where the crust of Mars is actually being pulled apart. In addition, in the Cerberus Fosse, you have the Cerberus Fosse Mantling Unit. And this is the apparent youngest, most recent area of volcanic activity on Mars. Now on Mars, we see volcanoes that are billions of years old to hundreds of millions of years old. But here at the Cerberus Fosse Mantling Unit, we are seeing an area that had volcanic activity that would be measured in less than a million years. We're looking at thousands of years. This is a really incredible area of study. Also across the surface of Mars, while we see impact craters, we also see a different class of holes in the ground. We see these pits. These are apparent skylights, areas where roofs have collapsed above subterranean lava tubes, great caverns where liquid lava was once flowing. Now, while there's no liquid water flowing on the surface of Mars now, we have some hints that perhaps there may still be liquid water flowing beneath the surface. So lava tubes such as this could be very fascinating places to look. They are also shielded from by, by the native rock around them. They're shielded from radiation, from thermal extremes, from meteorite impacts. So some people think that these could be good habitats for us in the future when we live and work on Mars. And they could also be good places to look for perhaps past or even existent life on Mars today. Now, when we send humans to live and work on Mars, they're going to need water. There is, of course, abundant water at the poles and the polar ice caps. But we don't want to send our astronauts there. It's a very, very harsh environment. But fortunately, as this map available in Mars Trek shows, there are bands of mid-latitude glaciers on Mars. Much more habitable environment. And again, with water ice available. So let's take a look at one of those mid-latitude glaciers. This takes the form of a valley glacier. The glaciers are all debris covered. They're coated with dirt and dust. So they don't stand out as brilliant white. And they're covered in that ubiquitous Martian dust. But here you can see uh, clear signs of flow in a valley glacier. Uh, here's another close-up view of a valley glacier. And you can see uh, medial moraines. You can see flow features. This looks very much like glaciers you may have seen here on Earth. Uh, another example here, uh, you see this toe of ice sticking out from between the mountains here. On Earth, we would call this a Piedmont glacier. We can zoom in closer to that toe sticking out there. And you can see, again, lines of flow going across it. Another type of glacier that is very common are these lobate debris apron glaciers that frequently form around mountain peaks. They form lenticular shapes. You can see a number of glacial ridges, and you can even see a Bergschrund crevasse where the ice has pulled away from the face of the mountain. 
We also find concentric fill glaciers where glacial ice can fill large craters. And we see wonderful stories. Here we see an example of what's called a rampart crater. Now, oftentimes when you look at Mars or the moon, craters will be surrounded by ejecta blankets of hot, dry, pulverized rock that have been thrown out. But in some cases like this, you see an ejecta blanket that is very thick and pasty. It almost looks like you're looking at where a rock got thrown into a mud puddle. And that's pretty much what happened. This was an impact that happened in an area rich of subsurface ice. And so you've got this thick, pasty ejecta blanket around it. If you look carefully, coming out from the top, you will see some dark fluvial features where water actually then flowed out across the surface. And then subsequent to all of that, you have one of those lobate debris apron glaciers that has advanced across the landscape. And you can tell the glacier itself is younger than the impact because the glacier is actually overriding part of that ejecta blanket. We talked about the great Northern Ocean that Mars once had well over 3 billion years ago. Uh, we can see evidence for this in the laser altimetry but some of my favorite evidence for this comes actually not within the body of the ocean itself, but inland from the ocean. Now, again, this ocean was in place in the early part of the solar system when there were a lot of meteoroid and asteroid bombardments going on. And those bombardments, when they would hit the ocean, would cause gigantic tsunamis hundreds of meters tall or even more, rushing inland. And to this day inland, we can see the chaotic thumbprint pattern of turbulent scarring on the surface there as the water flowed over the inland surface. And then we can see backflow channels where the water rushed back out across the land back toward the ocean basin. Moving on to Mercury, we have our Mercury Trek portal. We can visualize Mercury's largest impact basin, the Caloris Basin. And fascinatingly, directly opposite on the globe, we have this area that has been labeled weird terrain, very jumbled, broken terrain and this was formed by the shock wave expanding out from the Caloris Basin, going all the way around the planet and refocusing on the far side, antipodal to the impact basin. And where that shock wave all came together, it disrupted the ground in a very spectacular way. We see impact craters all across Mercury, but we also see irregularly shaped craters sometimes surrounded by ash deposits. These are pyroclastic volcanic vents, areas of volcanic activity on Mercury. And they're actually quite common. In a number of the impact craters, we see bright crater floor deposits, uh, also called hollows, where volatile minerals have been turned to gas by the intense heat of Mercury. Ceres was discussed by both of our speakers tonight, previous to me. And we have our Ceres Trek portal. Here we're zooming in to Ahuna Mons, a cryovolcano on Ceres, standing about 4,000 meters tall. Uh, volcanism on Ceres is a bit different. The role of magma is taken by briny ice water beneath the crust. Uh, we also have ancient cryovolcanoes uh, that over time, the temperature and gravity environment of Ceres causes them to slump down into low lying pancakes. But again, with the elevation profiling tool, you can explore these features in detail. Another example of volcanism and cryovolcanism on Ceres comes in Akater Crater 
with the faculae that are actually salt deposits. The salty water erupted, the actual water ice then volatilized into space and left the salt behind in these brilliant white deposits. And at features such as the Samhain Kitani, we see an area above, apparently, a rising mantle plume that rises up, strikes the floor of the crust, and spreads out. As it spreads, it drags the crust and fractures it in these extensional cracks. Vesta, uh, we have a portal for that. Vesta, at one time, was a nice, perfectly spherical object but uh, it doesn't look like that today. The top of it still looks fairly round, but if you look at the bottom here, it almost looks like some of it is missing. And that's because that's exactly the case. In this laser altimetry view, we can see the Reyes Silvia impact basin, a giant impact basin, where a smaller asteroid hit Vesta and nearly destroyed it. Reyes Silvia is about a billion years old. We can see Reyes Silvia overlies a similarly sized, more ancient basin, the Venenia Basin, about 2 billion years old. And so these two impacts almost destroyed Vesta and left it the peculiar shape that it has today. The central peak within the Reyes Silvia crater is actually one of the more impressive mountains in the solar system. It stands 21 kilometers tall rivaling Olympus Mons. But for a very small world, this is a very huge mountain indeed. Looking across the equator of Vesta, we see these circumferential fractures, such as the Devalia Fosse. And these are arranged circumferentially around the Reyes Silvia Basin, showing how close the asteroid came to complete destruction. We also see areas of pitted terrain that show us where there were deposits of ice beneath the surface that then were heated by nearby meteoroid impacts and volatilized, turned into gas that expanded and erupted, forming these fields of rimless pits. Continuing with our exploration of asteroids, we have the Bennu Trek portal visiting the near-Earth asteroid Bennu, which uh, was the subject of exploration by the OSIRIS-REx mission this past year. We can actually zoom down to Nightingale Crater, where OSIRIS-REx gathered its surface samples. And we can even see strange boulders standing out. These are exogenous basalt and from their spectral signature, these are actually fragments of Vesta that have landed on the surface of Bennu. We also have the Ryugu Trek portal, another near-Earth asteroid, another rubble pile. This was visited recently by Japan's Hayabusa 2 mission, and this past year it returned samples from the surface of Ryugu. And you can examine data from the Hayabusa 2 mission in detail with the Ryugu Trek portal. The Titan Trek portal takes you to Saturn's largest moon. And you can peer down through the dense, cloudy atmosphere of Titan to see chains of islands in the lakes and seas of liquid hydrocarbons, ethane and methane. Very, very frigid incredibly spectacular terrain on Titan. The icy moon tracks examine seven of Saturn's other small icy moons. These are Dione, Enceladus, Iapetus, Mimas, Phoebe, Rhea, and Tethys. We just recently released the Venus Trek portal. Uh, this is very exciting to us because uh, we are now planning some upcoming missions to Venus. It's high time for a return. And so here using radar data, we are piercing the thick atmosphere of Venus to view Artemis Corona, a giant 
complex uh, volcanic activity. And we've also recently released uh, the Europa Trek portal for Jupiter's moon Europa. Again, the topic of upcoming exploration from the European Space Agency and from NASA. Here you can see the chaotic terrain and the ridges of the global ice cap that overlies an ocean of liquid water estimated to have about two and a half times the volume of all of Earth's oceans combined. We can only wonder what might be swimming in that ocean. So with that, I'll close. I want to thank you. I also want to tip my hat to the wonderful team I have down at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the great engineers that have put this together. We're continuing to expand the portal. I invite you to join us at trek.nasa.gov and explore the solar system with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian, for an excellent presentation. Lots of interesting things to explore, especially in our upcoming winter here, where we'll have nothing but clouds until about March or so. So thanks again. Uh, Emma, do we have any questions for Brian? Um, no, there's no questions for Brian at the moment. Thank you so much. No questions. All right. Very good. Um, thank you, Brian, once more. And um, that wraps up our speakers for the evening. Mm -hmm.